Blog Talk Radio. Good evening and welcome to a special edition of the Catholic Defender Radio Show. Tonight with your host Don Hartley, the Catholic Defender, we will examine in depth the truths of our faith and why we believe them. Tonight, Don Hartley's guest host is Dr. Gregory Thompson, an expert on many of the Eucharistic miracles proving the real presence of Jesus in the consecrated host. Tonight, Dr. Thompson will lead an in-depth examination of one of these Eucharistic miracles. Here now is Dr. Thompson. Good evening around the world. God bless you, every one of you. We need you so bad, the remnant that's out there. If you're listening, you're a part of that remnant uh, that belongs to the good Lord. Uh, Some of the servant spiritual warriors taking the time to increase faith and enhance your walk to eternity. And may the good Lord use us Every, every week to bring Eucharistic miracles uh, showing his love that has been there from the beginning and where he has shown us that he died for us while we were yet sinners. And we're going to have, we're called to run the race right now, to run the race. And part of that is having the tools and, that can enhance our walk, strengthen us, give us all we need uh, to be better servant warriors for the good Lord. You know, he uses our hands and feet and our our, uh, heart and tongue to stand up and speak up for the truth that is part of the deposit of faith within the Catholic Church. So tonight, we're going to have another uh, Eucharistic miracle out of that love he's shown us. And with me tonight, we have uh, Don Hartley. Don, thank you for uh, making it possible for us to have this program out of New York that's sent around the world uh, to try to wake up and not only wake up people, but to enhance their... uh, knowledge uh, and catechesis that we are sometimes blessed to be able to bring to the table and help uh, people in their walk to eternity. Don, thank you for that. Well, and thank you, Greg, also. I tell you, this is so important, and I love what you were talking about, running that race. I'm looking at uh, Hebrews chapter 12, beginning with verse 1, therefore, since we are Surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Oh, wow. So you, you, you're you right on top of it. And I've also got, we've got Doc from uh, Tennessee. Hey, Doc. How are you doing tonight? Hey, y'all. How are you doing? That's yeah, I wanted to get on the show tonight and, and uh, try to, try to, help you guys out with this ministry. Um, I want to amplify what you were saying earlier in your opening uh, about we're called to be spiritual warriors. And, Don, yesterday in your show you had said something about how you had talked to all these women and you, you asked them, are you happy with your husband being a spiritual wimp? And all the men, you know, they didn't say nothing. To, only two women, they didn't miss, they misunderstood you. They raised their hand. But, you know, me and my wife were talking about that, and my wife said a lot of the men, you know, they, they kind of like all this new progressive and stuff like that, and I disagree with her. I think a lot of the men have been marginalized, and we have been neutered, and we've been muzzled. And it's time for us to stand up and take back our church 
from the evil forces that have dwelt among us. People don't realize we're in a spiritual war. And like the St. Michael's prayer, you know, cast into hell all the evil spirits prowl about the world seeking a ruin of souls. They are among us. They're in the church. They're in our schools. They're in our businesses. But and they they've infiltrated and it's it's about time us men stand up and be men and take back what God has given us. Man, I tell you, uh, Greg, don't you think that Mark Kaiser would love this love uh, doc there? <laughs> Mark Kaiser would be yes. <laughs> well, let's keep oh, together, yeah. man. I'm all for it. Yeah, Mark. Yep. Mark. Mark was really trying to wake up the men, for sure. Well, and, yep. Uh, we're we're very blessed. First, that the that the ladies, thank God for them. They kept the doors to the church open all these years, and now it is definitely time. It's been time for many years that the men start standing up and being Catholic men again. You know. Amen to that. And besides yourself, Doc, we have uh, Michael from New Jersey. Michael, are you there? Here, hey, Mike. He's here. What's up, Doc? Hey, <laughs> I am here, man. Uh, we went we we went through our rosary to get here tonight and uh, finished it just as I was dialing the phone. <laughs> you can talk about timing. Yeah. Hmm. You know, we got a uh, we we got a war on our hands. That's for we sure. Most, we most certainly do. And you know, uh, Archbishop Fulton Sheen, who uh, I love to quote, he said, "It's not going to be the clergy that saves the church. It's going to be the laity that saves the church." That's right. And he saw well, it coming even then. Oh yeah, he saw yeah. he saw all this coming. Yeah, and he warned the month, us. He did. Yeah. The month of June belongs to honoring the Sacred Heart of Jesus. The Catholic Church holds this honor high, following the Lord Jesus Christ's Sacred Heart. The devotion began in the 1670s when Jesus appeared multiple times to St. Margaret Mary Alico, a visitation nun in Francis, or France. Through these visions, he told her how he wished to be honored with the symbol of his heart, asking for the faithful to make amends for any wrongdoing they had done. Frequently take communion and observe the holy hour, Eucharistic Adoration. In 1856, the devotion was added to the church calendar by Pope Pius IX. Now, in direct contradiction to this, Biden, Joe Biden, is calling for equality in his latest proclamation declaring June 2022 20, as lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, and intersex, LB, LGBTQ Pride Month. So Joe Biden is outwardly demonstrating to the Sacred Heart of Jesus. Sadly, he, all, he does oh, yeah. not respect or he does not fear the warning that Our Lady of Fatima gave to the children of Fatima. She warns that more souls go to hell because of the sins of the flesh than any other reason. And so I make that distinction because this is what's happening right now. And, yeah, uh, they've, been trying, I mean, so, they've been trying to jack this month for decades and they, now it's Queer Month or Indoctrination Month is what I like to call it, where they're coming after our children. And this is the whole thing I've been saying. We have been silent too long. This stuff has got to stop. If you want to dress up like a girl or a boy or whatever, that's fine. You want to play dress up, you go and do that. But I don't have to play along. And, yes, I can be offended. I have a right to be offended at that stuff, and I have a right to speak out against it. You know, that doesn't make me misogynistic or homophobic or anything like that. You know, you want you want to make love to a turnip, I don't care. I'll defend your right to do it, but you do not have to go out and shove it down everybody's throat. you got a twisted reality on your body and on your life. You need help. 
you know, I will pray for you and I will, you can get help, but you do not have the right to force it on us. And this, this regime, this illegal puppet government that we have the, needs to understand that there are much more of us than there are of them. And we are going to take it back and we'll do it without even firing a shot. Well, i tell you what, in Dallas, Texas last night, they had these transsexuals. Uh, they, they were having this, this thing where they had children putting money in these transsexuals' underwear. And they had this on Greg hmm. Kelly tonight. He, they were exposing it. And so this is Greg. war. And, I, and Greg, you, can you, Greg, do you remember what it says in Matthew chapter 18, verse 6 and 7? Do you remember that, what it says there? Yeah, if, uh, that's where it talks about uh, if 10 of you uh, scandalized take any of my children away from me, it would be better that you had a millstone around your neck and dumped in the deepest part of the sea. Oh, yeah. Well, uh, uh, Donald, our current president is not the only one who's weighed in on this subject. Another president did so. And he said this, and I quote, We have been the recipients of the choicest bounties of heaven. We have grown in numbers, wealth, and power as no other nation has ever grown. But we have forgotten God. We have forgotten the gracious hand which preserved us in peace and multiplied and enriched and strengthened us, and we have vainly imagined in the deceitfulness of our hearts that all of these blessings were produced by some superior wisdom or virtue of our own. Intoxicated with unbroken success, we have become too self-sufficient to feel the necessity of redeeming and preserving grace, too proud to pray to the God that made us. The man who's the president who said that was our 16th, Abraham Lincoln, March 30th, 1863. You know, the first time I heard you read that, I could have sworn it was Ronald Reagan, and then you said it was Abraham Lincoln. And I, I, I can't Reagan help says, but notice in a similarity between the two men and the way they oh, govern. Absolutely. Absolutely. And right now, right now, this uh, our our Congress, our congressional representatives, and others are are looking down the barrel of a gun to see what the problem is. Well, they're looking down the wrong end of the barrel. Yes, they are. The problem are. is we have we have we have forgotten God. We have forgotten who gave us what we have. I tell you what, the well, answer is like the work that Gregory's been doing in setting up these. Uh, local uh, uh, where people can come and hear great speakers pro- providing great talks about our holy Catholic faith. That is a very important answer. And Greg, you were just in the boot hill there in southern Missouri today, weren't you? I was. Uh, I I'd come down there for a different reason initially, but try always try to kill two birds with one stone when I get in an area. And uh, I spoke to a young lady that, uh, with her condition, uh, she said, I think 83, 87% of the people that uh, have that condition abort their child. And uh, she will carry hers to term which her term is to be on uh, September 8th. Yeah, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, she, uh, her, uh, the birth of the child is supposed to be September 8th, which is my birthday. She needs a lot of prayer. So we'll ask for a prayer for Laura. And, uh, if it's meant to have a miraculous woman or if the good Lord is ready to take that little one on into heaven and uh, both ways it'll be give a smile to the good Lord for sure. And uh but anyway, uh talk to her I, I just got her testimony and had her uh talk to me about why uh, 
what was her background? Was she a cradle Catholic? And, you know, and uh, how did she come to be where she is now? This is her eighth year as, as principal of a, of a little Catholic school in a town uh, in south uh, southern Missouri. And uh, she's the first one in all my travels. And I've, I've probably been to, I don't know, 40, 40 plus schools. And uh, first one that I've seen were the principals sitting there before school and praying the rosary and the children answering her um, before she gives the children to the to the uh, teachers. That needs to be done in every school, not only in the United States but in the world. Uh, yeah, it would be nice. I talked to her about. Uh, you know, they've added so many things uh, to the curriculum. Like I told her, I said, but the good Lord does not care if you know the Pythagorean theory. But he does care if you know him, you know. And it, and uh, Our Lady, you have all these things from man, man's uh, intelligence or lack of it. Uh, that have added things to the curriculum in the Catholic schools, but uh, we don't do what Mary said to do, say the rosary every day. And so many of these young people, probably the majority of them, are not getting it at home, and so we need need the schools to lay that base and help the parents. Uh, you know, what she said that she's noticed since she started doing that, uh, the peace that the children have, they aren't as wired up and everything, and that it's noticeable, and that, you know, she's had uh, parents call her and uh, want to know, are, you know are, you, are you doing the rosary at 730? And then adjusting their time of when they bring their child to school so that they can be a part of that rosary. And... Uh, it's just uh, uh, pretty awesome, you know. Uh, the the other two days of the week, they do the mass. They have a mass, but she makes sure that they say the rosary. You know, uh, and now she's got so many of her teachers, and this is very key. Also, uh, something I'll, I'll stress when we bring it forward, but. Uh, Several of the teachers, if not all of them, most of the teachers have done a curseal, and many of those have uh, made the consecration to the uh, Sacred Heart of Jesus through the Sharp and Immaculate Heart of Mary. And those type of things don't happen in a vacuum. You know, it takes a, uh, a good shepherd, which she has. I know him very well. I think a uh, uh, thank you, do too, Donald. Uh, Father Joseph Kelly. Yes, uh, he's a, he's an absolute jewel of a priest, and uh, he uh, uh, not only uh, is supportive of her, but does things to help her initiate what she felt uh, led to do, and. Uh, he reinforces it. You know, she's kind of like, she's a, like an under shepherd for the shepherd of the parish. And both shepherds uh, keying in on, uh, in the education of the children, the most important thing that they can do is do everything they can to get the children's souls to heaven for eternity. And any school that's not prioritizing that puts children at risk. You know, whenever you're just uh, going to teach them, just like the world teaches, you know, uh, you're you're going to put your children at risk. It's got to be prioritized that, uh, you know, all, the, all day long in in the uh, in the school system, you can make God a part of things all day long. And uh, for so many years, we haven't done that in the Catholic universities and and uh you know and so you know you're just burning money up for your children you know uh 
to send them to most of the Catholic colleges in this country. Probably most, probably at least half of, half of their uh, teachers are not even Catholic, you know, and they've got them uh, teaching a lot of different things, but not focusing on their souls for eternity. And uh, there's probably not a handful of Catholic colleges in this country that you would be safe in uh, sending your children to as far as uh, the community. It doesn't exist. I tell you, I tell you this, uh, Greg, I've got about 5,000 people that I've got a population that I've been placing these 15 promises that I've done in shows, as shows, that our Lord and Our Lady give for those who uh, pray the rosary. And then also the 12 promises for honoring the Sacred Heart. This is where it is at. It really is. And if you really want to grow and do what the Lord wants... Man, those are the two things to look into. Uh, Mike, you got that? Uh, uh, you got that uh, right up in front of you? I got. Uh, I got the uh, text in front of me. I think. Okay. You know, it starts off with. A, I had a picture of Saint Lucy. Yeah. And uh, she was a very inspirational uh, uh, saint for me in my college mm-hmm. days. And yeah. one of the and, the, and a lady that I helped bring to the Catholic Church uh, at the Easter Vigil a couple of years ago, St. Lucy appeared to her, which mm. is a powerful story. Yeah. Really true story. It, 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 has, it has, it's an amazing story. So St. Lucy, and you know, we like we said with what with Greg said about running the race, and what it says in Hebrews chapter twelve, when we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, all the saints, we got heaven on our. They're praying for us. Oh man! And so, and we got the peace plan. The Virgin Mary gave us the peace plan at Fatima. The praying the rosary, just like. What uh, Sean and and Doc was doing just right before showtime, they had just finished the rosary. Man, ain't that something when husband and wife are praying the rosary together? Oh, man, that's blessed. That is blessed. Oh, that is so blessed. And hi, Sean, as well as uh, Doc. Uh, Greg, do you want to go ahead and uh, cover this real quick? Yeah, uh, let's go ahead and... uh... Have uh, Doc? If, do you have the do you have the reading there, Doc? Hey, Mike. Beginning with I'm Saint here. Gregory of. All right, go ahead. Well, where are we starting? No, well, I want Saint Gregory to do, is nice. Yeah, I, I wanted Doc to do that, and then you follow okay. up with the Eucharist. Then, then Michael, then you do the Eucharistic miracle. Okay. If Doc doesn't, have, if Doc doesn't. Have, do you have he that, doesn't Doc? have the article. He doesn't have All right, that, here, no. here we go. I'll do that, and then you follow me, Michael. Okay. St. Gregory of Nyssa. Rightly then do we believe that the bread consecrated by the word of God has been made over into the body of the God, of the, God the word, for that body was, as to its potency, bread, but it has been consecrated by the law by the lodging there of the word who pitched his tent in the flesh. He offered himself for us, victim and sacrifice and priest as well, and the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. When did he do this? When he made his own body food and his own blood drink for his disciples. For this much is clear. It's clear enough to anyone that a sheep cannot be eaten by a man unless it's being eaten, being eaten, be preceded by it, it's being slaughtered. This giving of his own body to his disciples for eating clearly 
indicates that the sacrifice of the lamb has now been completed. The bread is at first common bread, but when the mystery sanctifies it, it is called and actually becomes the body of Christ. You know, there, there's uh, the doctors of the church all have uh, something to say on the uh, on the uh, Eucharist. You know, it's, it's be be a good uh, teaching for each of us to go into, look up the doctors of the church, and then just put in there uh, what did they say about the Eucharist, and you you'll have a lot a lot of growth in what you uh, read doing that. So that's for everybody in the world. Start uh, uh, studying to show yourself approved. Uh, look up the ones that have been there before us, the doctors of the church and uh, the fathers of the church, and see what they say uh, way before we came along. So uh, go, ahead and, go ahead and start the uh, Eucharistic miracle, or, uh, Michael. Okay. In the Eucharistic miracle of Bedrun, a very pious farmer, in an excess of zeal, stole a sacred host, which he brought into his farm in Vebrun. One day the host accidentally fell to the ground, but no one could pick up the sacred species. Everything was tried, and finally the Bishop of Regensburg intervened. The Bishop was able to pick up the host only after promising the Lord that he would build a church in honor of the Blessed Sacrament. The report of the miracle spread rapidly and attracted a large number of pilgrims. The building of the village of Betbrun and of the present-day Church of the Holy Savior owed their existence to a Eucharistic miracle that took place in 1125. In the place where the town and the church are located now, there was only a small farm called Vrebrun. Next, next to it, there was a well that was used to give water to the livestock. The owner was a man who was deeply devoted to the Most Holy Sacrament. This man lived an hour and a half away from the parish church of Froling and was, all, and was not always able to attend Mass. Because of his zeal, he decided to solve the problem of not always being able to attend church by secretly stealing a sacred host and taking the Blessed Sacrament home with him. The farmer took a, took a stick that he always brought with him and made an opening on the top end of it into which he placed the sacred host. Every day when the livestock were resting, he stuck his stick into the ground and knelt before the most holy sacrament for many hours. For several months, the man continued in this manner until one day, without thinking, he impulsively threw the stick with the blessed sacrament at a, at a herd that had strayed too far. The host fell on the ground and the farmer, deeply saddened, bent down to pick up the Blessed Sacrament. Every attempt to lift the host up proved to be futile, and when he, when he did not know what else to do, he sent for the parish priest of Froling. But, the, but the, priest was not, the priest was also not able to pick up the Blessed Sacrament, and finally they approached the bishop of Regensburg, who immediately went into the place of the miracle with all his clergymen. Only when he promised to build a chapel in that place did he succeed in picking up the host from the ground. In the year 1125, the building of the chapel was completed, and the previous relic was kept in its place until 1330, where a fire destroyed everything. The chapel was later reconstructed, and its interior, they placed one of the pillars that had been saved from the fire. That's quite a story. It, it is. And, it is. And it's not the first time that uh, something has happened in a miraculous way. Like uh, mm -hmm. started with uh, St. Lucy. They wanted her to, uh, they were going to put her in a brothel because she wouldn't uh, give herself to a pagan king. Mm -hmm. And when they went to try to move her, they could not move her. The people, uh, the ones trying to move her said she was like a mountain, that she couldn't move it. <laughs> and, Talk about uh, gaining a little weight. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> pretty awesome what the good Lord uh, can do uh, to open our open our eyes. 
Mm -hmm. Speak about opening up their eyes. I mean, if any man looked upon her lustfully, they lost their sight and got their sight only regained when she intervened and interceded for them, which they would ask for her, her intercession when they became blind and they would receive their sight back. But, uh, yeah, she was a great virgin and martyr. What a story, St. Lucy. Amen. Amen. And this, and this story here has significance to me because I did not. I mean, when I when I put this together, I did not realize what had happened to me because yesterday was Pentecost, and I had grabbed an extra. I was able to a uh, pix, and I had an extra host that I was going to give to my wife Gigi. And when I was preparing to to give Gigi the Eucharist, I discovered that the host was not in the pics. It was gone. And talk about sudden horror. I had lost Jesus somehow. I don't know how that was possible. And I looked everywhere. I mean, I went to... Uh, you know, my clothes I was wearing and my my sports jacket. How could that? How could that? The Eucharist somehow vanished like it did. And uh, I ended up going back to the church, and I was able to receive another uh, uh, Eucharist to give to Gigi. But what happened to the other one? What happened to the original one that I got for her? Because it, it, it had vanished. I had never experienced anything in my whole life this way. Never. As long did you as ever I've been find, doing this did, kind did, of... did you ever find the missing host? The only explanation that uh, we came up with is that St. Micah was playing a game with me, that he took the Eucharist and gave it to somebody in the Ukraine, which is he is the uh, uh, patron saint of the Ukraine. That and could so very that well have happened. Explanation. That's the only explanation yeah. I got, because I, I mean, <laughs> to this, I mean, I, I talk, I mean, I felt like I, I could understand Jesus, Joseph and Mary, when they lost Jesus, who was, they were they for three days. Yeah. I, I mean, that will forever be implanted in my head now. Ever, I mean, any time I re recall that story about Jesus being found in the temple, yeah. that will always that will always be here. And and I'm looking at St. Anthony, or not St. Anthony. I did ask involve him, too. St. Anthony, he's a patron of lost and found. Can you help me here? <laughs> you know, can you tap uh, uh, St. Michael on the shoulder and say, man, come on, let's let's let the kid, let's bring the kid in on all this. Because <laughs> uh, I had, uh, you know, and I told Gregory about that. And Gregory was saying, like, well, it could have been an angel, but how do you know it's St. Michael? Well, he's he's done that before. He you know he's done that. So you know, no telling. There's no way I can't prove it. We, I can't we, say we can't that we can't say that it was St. Michael for sure. No, no. I just I just giving him credit. That's all I would do. That's all I could say because I can't prove it. Other than I know that when I went up there to receive the Eucharist to for myself, but I also received as uh, you know in the pics. I was given a Eucharist, and I closed the pigs, and I placed it appropriately on my person. And when I got home, I noticed that the Eucharist was in the pigs, and I was going to give it to my wife. And later on, when I was preparing to do so, the Eucharist was gone. And Gigi basically, she, she said, I didn't touch it. I promise you, I did not touch it. I, 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 you know. She and I were both were shocked, and uh, I, I was like, "Oh my goodness!" Because I mean, th you, you, if you can imagine the horror that I was going through, because there was no way that I could not. There's no way I could. I, there's no way that I could figure how that what happened here. Yeah. But uh, uh, if I mean, I, I mean, I can't yeah, like think what a saint, Saint Gregory. <laughs> That's great. I can't prove that it's Saint Michael. I just know that he's done that kind of. He he's he's done that before. And also the angel of Portugal did that with uh, the three children of Fatima. 
you know, you know that mm-hmm. the angels cannot consecrate the Eucharist. It has to be a Catholic priest to do that. And whenever the Lord has need or a situation, an angel has gone into the tabernacle and and gotten our Lord for whatever, like the the, the, the case there at uh, Portugal. So that's the only explanation that that I uh, came up with, and so. And I, when I mentioned it up there at the church, when I asked for, you know, about getting another Eucharistic, you know, consecrated host, they thought that was a beautiful story. And that's my story. That's my Eucharistic miracle. Now, it's something that uh, I can only, I, I could smile at St. Michael and said, uh, you know, okay, you know, you got me. <laughs> and so... You have to take some things like this. Uh, yeah. The Lord has a sense of humor, too. Oh, he most certainly uh, does. He does. And well, he, he made all of us. Boy, did he. He, yeah, he, <laughs> did. Uh, he, got me on, he got me on that one. I, I was totally, I mean, I was going, I was at horror for, uh, until, I mean, I, I, I don't, I, I, to this point, I mean, I have no earthly idea. There's nothing that I can say that how that host came up missing like that. Because I know I didn't do it. I know I didn't do it, and I know Gigi didn't do it either. And there ain't, I mean, you know, okay, come on now. All right, angels. I mean, you know, I, I know my my guardian angel, he could be, he'd be, may, he may be playing with me too. Because he, well, you let's, know. Let's go back I to the know. Eucharist. Well, right. but this, uh, but this, because this, this is, could you imagine? You're flying. You could, nobody could touch it. Go ahead there, Greg. Yeah, that's right. Uh, St. Albert the Great, who was a doctor of the church, uh, yes. writing on the Lord's yes, he is. Jesus, he could not have commanded anything more beneficial, for this sacrament is the fruit of the tree of life. Anyone who receives this sacrament with a devotion of sincere faith will never taste death. It is a tree of life for those who grasp it, and blessed is he who holds it fast. The man who feeds me shall live on account of me. Our, lo- our Lord, uh, uh, here's, here's one from uh, St. Ambrose. I beg of you, O Lord, by this most holy mystery of your body and blood, with which you daily nourish us in your church, that we may be cleansed and sanctified and made sharers in your divinity. I'm going to segue on that just a minute before I finish it. Today, we celebrated at Mass today uh, Mary, the mother of the church. Uh, that That's a, a feast day, I think it was established in uh, in in 2018, but uh, grant to me your ho- holy virtues, Lord, which will enable me to approach your altar with a clean conscience, so that this heavenly sacrament may be a means of salvation and life to me. For you yourself have said, "I am the living bread that has come down from heaven. If anyone eat of this bread, he shall live forever." And the bread that I will give is my flesh for the life of the world. And that's about the moment in time when the first Protestants walked away from the good Lord, wasn't it, now? Yeah, that's exactly what happened. When Jesus gave the uh, uh, 5,000, the 5,000, the bread of life discourse, he gave the bread of life discourse, and, and they couldn't accept it. And even asked the apostles, do you also, also wish to leave me? And Peter said, to whom shall we go? For you have the words of everlasting life. And so that's that's important. One one thing that makes this uh, a little bit uh, a smaller world many times, we think that, you know, very much a coincidence. I had a uh, friend of mine, I had this set up for uh, today to talk to this principal. And a friend of mine talking about something completely different. She, she and her husband had put me up when I came down into the uh, Cape Girardeau area for years. They had put me up, 
And uh, when I started saying I've got to meet a young principal over at uh, over at Chaffee, and and uh, she said, "What's her name?" And I said, "Laura." And uh, she said, "We uh, we did the uh, uh, adoration together on first Fridays. They're from two different cities. Those two people that." I, one I had uh, stayed with for years when I would come into that area. And the other one was a principal that I just met this last year. And uh, they'd actually uh, done adoration together every first Friday. That's, that's pretty awesome, you know, how small the world is sometimes that brings the ones that God puts into our path together. And... Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, another element, I believe, what made that uh, uh, young principal uh, such a strong warrior for for the good Lord, his mother, the church, the rosary, the, uh, the Eucharist, and everything, was the fact that she went to adore uh, the good Lord on a regular basis. It reminds me of what... St. Alphonsus Liguori, who's another doctor of the church, uh, he said, realize that you may gain more in a quarter of an hour of prayer before the Blessed Sacrament than in all other practices of the day. You know, I, 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 I think that even if we just go for 5, 10, 15 minutes and acknowledge the good Lord, he just loves our, us coming into his presence, you know, to give him some time during our day that we make a special moment in time when we come by to say hi to him and just talk to him as our father. Mm-hmm. We got uh, Doc. Doc, what do you think about this? You've been kind of patient there listening to some of this. What do you think yeah, about this? Yeah, I, I, well, you know, I mean, it goes back to what I was saying earlier with the catechism. Um, people don't understand the Catholic faith. Most Catholics I know really don't have a clue about their faith because they're not taught it. They're not taught it in the schools. You got prayer in school, and uh, one thing when you were talking about that that teacher praying before the principal praying before the, she released the students, I guarantee you. You know, I went to school, and every test I had, I prayed. There is prayer in school. Why can't we as a society acknowledge it? Everybody, five minutes of prayer in school. If you don't believe in God, you got five minutes free time. Do what you want. Just be quiet so the rest of us can pray. What's the big problem? We, we need to bring that back. If we start praying as a society, we will become a more pious society and a more pi- and if you look throughout history the pious societies were the ones that received the most riches that that quote from abraham lincoln said it all when we started this country we were a judeo christian society it wasn't all catholic no but it was still a god fearing country and we got away from that and now look at where we're at you know this goes out to your listeners. If you have a neighbor who's having a problem or isn't having a problem, you don't know. Say a prayer for them. You don't have to know them. You don't have to tell them. Just say a prayer for your neighbor. Hey, I hope he gets his act together. Hey, I hope he has good health. It doesn't have to be fancy. It doesn't have to be anything much more than a few seconds of your time. And that right there is we start doing that. As a as a species, look at where we could go. Think about where we could. If we just tried that, and you know what? We will never know if everybody does it. But I think if everybody does it, we might know because I think we'll see a change, a fundamental change in the way people treat each other. Anyway, that, that's what was rolling in my head during all this time. Well, uh, there's there's no there's no doubt about that for sure. You know we're we uh, we're going to continue until we do that until we bring our country back under God. We will continue to have children slaughter children. 
it's going to ha- happen. Uh, we'll continue to to, to uh, kill babies, innocent babies in the womb. We'll send out pornography to the world. We'll have all the different things happen until we turn back to God. And Cardinal Burke said, Gregory, we've had such poor catechesis. This addresses what you said on that, uh, Doc. We've had such poor catechesis for the last 50 plus years. Even in Imagine the seminary. That. Even in the seminary. So the the priests don't know what they don't know, even the priests and, and bishops. You know, a lot of them, uh, for the last couple of years, I never assumed that a priest or bishop automatically knows, although I did when I was growing up when I was young. I thought, well, they know everything. Well, I think that they they don't know many things, and we need to, we need to help them in their walk, in their walk to eternity because we need the shepherds for sure. Amen. But, uh, but uh, some of them have been, uh, you know, when I hear priests talk about uh, the leadership and rectories, ter- you know, pulling apart rosaries, you know, something's wrong with you if you say the rosary, if you say the, if you go to adoration, different things, you know, they were, they would think that they were too, uh, I don't know what do you want to call it, but they were. I- a lot of those did not make it out of the seminaries because they they were too uh, too straight on things. I guess they uh, tried to embrace, and so sometimes they would hide hide what they do because of uh, the infiltration of the church into uh, in the different parts of that, and some of these that that were. Uh, Influence in these seminaries became bishops, and uh, we need to pray for them, you know, for sure, because uh, as much havoc as they've caused, you know, uh, one of the things uh, that was monumental, the number one thing that was monumental during the pandemic was the Catholic Church closing their doors as if as if uh, what the church had to offer was not essential, you know. But uh, going to Walmart or to beer joint or beer uh, someplace selling beer that was essential. But going to where God, uh, you know, rested in the tabernacle and uh, was present during mass. Uh, that was a lacking a, of the shepherds, for sure. No righteous masculinity there whatsoever. And no. uh, going back to what you said, I don't want to stray. I'm listening to what you say, and it's fundamental, and it's very profound. But a lot of what you're saying goes back to that track that went out before Vatican II. It came out AA 1025, and it talks about an anti-apostolate that infiltrated the church. It was a Russian spy uh, this guy was found, no ID. This nurse released his letters, and it tells this story exactly. They infiltrated the church. They rose up through the rank, and now they're referred to as what? The Lavender Mafia. And we need to stand as men, and when we have a priest up there preaching heresy, and I've heard it with my own two ears, we need to call him out on it. I mean, I'm sorry, Father, but uh, you're wrong. You can say that, but you better be right when you say it. You know, I mean, well, you know, we've, it, we've, we've had some very, very, very holy cardinals that addressed uh, the Pope on uh, that first thing, he, that first writing he put out. Uh, you remember what that was called, Donald? Uh Oh my golly! S- something. Uh, I think Leticia, I know what you're talking about. I can't remember. Be something. But they, but out of love for fellow, uh, out of love for the Pope, they they told him that this this is wrong. You cannot send this out to the people. It it'll cause confusion and and uh, which is what it did. And many people left the church. And. Uh, all that was orchestrated. Oh, it's definitely satanic, 
for sure. The, the church has been infiltrated to the highest level. I, I'm sorry if that offends people, but, you know, they, there's no other explanation. And we've been warned about this from Fulton Sheen and, and several of the church fathers. Christ himself talked about these demons of light coming in, the false angels that you, they prowl about the world seeking the ruin of souls. They, you know, but they don't catechize pe- our children are not taught that hell is real. They're not taught that the devil is real. It's all kumbaya. I love your neighbor. We all give the sign of peace. Yeah, slap you on the back. Let's go eat cake. You know, it, we need to get back to the fundamentals of Catholicism, real Catholicism. Like you said, look well, at what the church fathers wrote and go back to our roots. Is, and, and This is the issue. Anyway. Another parable Jesus put before them, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat. That's exactly what they did, and went away. So when the plants came up and bore again them, the weeds appeared also. Then the servants of the household Holder came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then has it weeds? He said to them, An enemy has done this. The servants said to him, Then do you want us to go and gather them? But he said, No, lest in gathering the weeds you read up the wheat along with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. At, and at harvest time I will tell the reapers. Gather the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn is so important. I mean, that is, Jesus explains this. Then he left the crowds and went into the house, and his disciples came to him saying, Explain to us the parable of the weeds in the field. He answered, He he who sows the, the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world, and the good seed means the sons of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the, is, is the close of the age, and the reapers are angels. Just as the weeds are gathered and burned with fire, so will it be at the close of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels and they will gather out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all evildoers and throw them into the furnace of fire. There men will weep and gnash their teeth. Then the righteous shall will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears, let him hear. And this is why I would prefer to be left behind. I don't want to be the first to go. Because the first to go is going to be the ones thrown in that fire. But if we are left behind, we will be placed in the barn. That's where we want to be. What do you, th- you think about that uh, there, uh, Mike? Yeah, that's where I want to be, too. I want to be in that barn. <laughs> that's now strange. we're still in the field, and I'm tired of the weeds trying to choke us out. I want to choke them out. Well, that's, well we do it. This yeah, one we piece it. of wheat ain't going down without a fight. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're not a weed. We are good. We are good seed. Greg is good seed. Greg is good seed. I tell you what, Greg is not just a piece of dirt painted gold. He's gold all the way through. Ain't that right, uh, Mike? Yeah, you got that right. All right, quit it, guys. <laughs> we should help each other to be humble. Absolutely. Amen to that. All right. And we're about to, you know, can you believe how fast this has gone? Uh, you know, it's almost 9 o'clock. Can you believe that? Time. Time flies when you're having fun. It sure do. It sure do. And so... Well, uh, Doc, can you hear me okay? 
Yeah, he hears you. Uh, he's still here. Go ahead, Doc. Yeah, I can hear you. I, I hear you. All right. Uh, why don't you end us with a prayer tonight? Okay. Uh, in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. I want to thank you. I want to thank you, Father, for giving us the air we breathe and the people we know and the support we have. And thank you, Father, for the troubles you give us and the hardships that we may overcome them with your help and with your support. And may we look to you when times are tough and realize we are not alone and we are stronger than we can possibly imagine through you. Through your grace and love, we pray for this. Amen. 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 Thank you, because of well, your prayer there, there. Uh, yes. That, 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 that's yeah. We didn't. Kathy wasn't here tonight, but uh, you know, sometimes she can, sometimes she can't be, depending on circumstances. But because of your prayer there, uh, uh, Doc, I'm going to play tonight's ending song in your and Sean's honor. Well, thank you. So when we're ready, are you ready for that, uh, Greg? Go for it. All right. And then we will see you next week, same bad time, same bad station, next Tuesday night at 8 o'clock. Wonderful. And thank you, Greg. And thank you. Thank the Lord for his safety coming home. He was on the road most of the day, and he got home in time for the show tonight.